Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO at AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. Welcome to the only show about the workplace that offers you front row seats and a microphone, bringing you practical, timely, and accurate insights so that you can more effectively lead your organization. It's Thursday, June 15th, episode 235. Today, it's halftime for the Battle of 2023. So today we're bringing you expert analysis from the field as we welcome back our Washington DC insider, Jim Plunkett, shareholder and senior government relations counsel at Ogletree Deacons. He'll help us look at what Congress has set in motion so far during the first half of the year, and then he'll offer us predictions on what's coming up in the second half. Stay tuned to get the X's and O's you need to be a winner at year's end. As always, we have polls for you, and we encourage your questions. All this and more on This Week at Work. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back, Bert. How are you doing this morning? Where the heck are you at, man? I am back out in my favorite state, the Republic of California, Phil. Yeah, you look like you've been uh, out playing uh, Hollywood all night or, or something <laughs> like that. Phil, let me ask you, when was the last time you actually pulled an all-nighter? No, um, I can't make it past 8.30, Bert. It's 8.30 <laughs> Central Time. I'm in bed. If I'm on if I'm East Coast, I'm in bed at 7.30. It, it just, it doesn't matter. I, I can't do that any longer, but I have done it in my day. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely too old for this. I, uh, the, the, I, I did get a little bit of sleep on the airplane, which doesn't really count. So by my estimation, the last time I really had some sleep was, uh, I, I woke up at about 6, 6.30 a.m. On, uh, on Wednesday, and today's Thursday, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So well, and and the, I'm out here for a union election, and the last uh, voting session ends at 8 p.m. tonight. So after that count, uh, hopefully by about nine o'clock, I'll be back at the hotel and get about uh, six, seven hours to sleep tonight before I have to catch my early morning flight back to St. Louis tomorrow. You, you know, the, maybe the last time I've, I've pulled an all-nighter like that was during an, a union election, and, mm -hmm. and that was enough punishment for me to never have to go through another union election <laughs> ever. But uh, hopefully your client will be successful, and, and we appreciate your dedication to the program. That's what you get with Burt Garland when you sign up with Ogletree Deacons. He's going to be right there by your side no matter how much sleep he gets. <laughs> uh, so we appreciate that, Bert. Um, and if if you got to dodge off and go take care of your client, we understand that. But um, I know we got a lot coming up with the program. I just want to share before we get to lawyer on the clock some of the things that are happening here at AIM. We do have the uh, blueprint for success, building a total reward strategy and gaining leadership buy-in, and that is with Mikey Mack, a favorite fan of the show. Uh, he comes on all the time, at least once a quarter, and gives us his compensation update. Uh, the in-person seating for that is sold out, but there's still time to join if you uh, are interested for part of the simulcast. That program is Tuesday, June 20th from 8.30 to 10.30. You can visit our website to enter that. It's only $25, but with all the things happening in compensation, it is uh, definitely a program that I think everyone will benefit from when we we talk about compliance and pay equity and all the things that um, some of our listeners have to put up with. It, it's really just almost impossible. I just spent the last two days traveling across the Midwest having these conversations and roundtables, and it's just darn near impossible to get it right today. Uh, and Mike is going to help with that strategy, and I think everyone will walk away in a little bit better shape than they came in with. All right, Bert, let's get you into Lawyer on the Clock and, and see what you got going, because we have our favorite, Jim Plunkett, our Washington insider, back with us today. Jim, good morning and welcome back to the program. How you been? Busy, Phil. There's yeah. there's, there's, there's no Not as busy as back. Bert. You didn't pull That's an all-nighter. That is, that is true. I can't, uh, uh, I've got to give Bert um, uh, the gold medal here. Um <laughs> Uh, I, I have I can't remember the last time I pulled an all nighter or two, yeah. um, but you're right. That's that's Bert living the the, the Ogletree client pledge. Um, but no, I'm 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 uh, uh, I'm doing great, Phil, and uh, I'm I'm happy to be here. I always uh, uh, love this program. 
All right. Well, we can't wait to, to hear from you and what we might expect in the second half of, of this year. But Bert, let's go ahead and let's kick it off with Lawyer on the Clock. All right. It's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're on the clock. So we need to be very, very careful. I think I've given some warnings on the program before about making hasty employment decisions. And also, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of a trend of backlash against DE&I type efforts. And in particular, I just want to chat really briefly. I can't get into too much detail about the case. Our firm did not represent Starbucks in this particular case, but I'm just offering the news out there that uh, Starbucks was hit with a $26 million verdict uh, in the last two days. That's a uh, lot of a, coffee. Yeah, in a, in, <laughs> That in is a, a lot in, of coffee. Yeah, in, in a reverse race discrimination case. And this particular case uh, ties back to what many people might recall when two black men were arrested in a Philadelphia cafe uh, because they were taking up space in the in the uh, restaurant, didn't order anything, and uh, the police were eventually called, and those individuals were arrested when they refused to leave the location. And there was a regional manager, a white regional manager, a female regional manager, who ended up being fired uh, in part because of that uh, decision by Star. Well, in part because of the arrest of those two individuals. And uh, so she brought a claim against uh, Starbucks. And again, the jury awarded $600,000 in compensatory damages and $25 million in punitive damages. So oh my uh, I think, yeah, this case really highlights how in responding to, you know, public criticism over uh, racist or any, frankly, any other incidents these days, you know, we're seeing things related to LGBTQ, IA plus, we're seeing things related to race. Companies really need to be cautious of the risk of these uh, reverse discrimination claims. So wow. it, 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 employers need to really take a measured approach and should not be making hasty uh, decisions. You know what comes to mind immediately after I get over the shock of $26 million, that's a huge fine, um, is AB is, you know, InBev in this case and, and what they're going through with Bud Light. I wonder if we don't see something come out of that. Almost, I, I can see some similarities, right? I think some people may have lost their job over over that campaign or what actually happened there. And, and I wonder if there isn't uh, some form of uh, discrimination that gets called to the table on that as well. Who knows? But yeah. it, it is one of those scenarios where, you know, you're, you're kind of darn if you do and darn if you don't uh, and what move you make. So tread lightly. Well, and, and that goes back to my advice uh, that I've offered repeatedly on the program of, you know, be careful uh, if you're a if you're a company wading into uh, these controversial issues because your uh, employee base and frankly, your customer base is made up of all kinds of different people. And uh, when you start wading into these things, that's when you start creating risk exposure. So yeah. just my two cents there. We appreciate that. That's, yep. uh, that's why you're on the program, Bert. What else you have? Yep. So also I wanted to chat real quickly about the National Labor Relations Board, our friends over at the NLRB, uh, just in the last couple of days have uh, revived an Obama era uh, standard for uh, looking at who is an employee versus an independent contractor. We've talked so much about on this program about uh, the various governmental agencies that are trying to classify as many people as possible as employees versus independent contractors. I really do believe that part of the policy goal behind this is that if the government can classify these folks as employees, then it makes it much more much easier for these employees to unionize. Uh, independent contractors really, they have no right to unionize, uh, but if they're employees, they do have a right to unionize. And uh, so the NLRB has has uh, attempted to revive this Obama era sta era standard uh, that puts um, that, that actually might run afoul of a couple of decisions, court decisions from the D.C. Circuit 
Uh, now, previously, under the, the tests that are used uh, the last several years, the, what, what's really looked at is uh, the, the, the entrepreneurial uh, opportunity uh, that's placed over other factors. And so if the, employee, if the independent contract, contractor has the, the uh, opportunity for profit and loss, uh, also has the opportunity to either accept work or reject work, uh, then that looks like then an independent contractor relationship. And uh, what the board is trying to do is to put those things uh, by the wayside and really look at more of, from more of an a economic realities approach and uh, trying to really look and see what the relationship is. And, uh, you know, this is really targeted at the, at the gig economy, the Ubers and Lyfts and uh, all those independent contractors out there and trying to get them classified as employees to really make it easier for unions to organize those sectors of the economy. Yeah, yeah. and I know that might be the target, but I think the ramifications are going to be um, very deep and very wide. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to hear what Jim might have to say on, on the timeline of when we might expect to, to see uh, Washington uh, unravel that a little bit as well. What else yep, you have, Bert? Anything else for us today? I do. I've, I've got one other thing for you. Arbitration agreements. We've talked quite a bit about this. Everybody knows from listening to us on the program that last year, uh, Congress, in a, a rare bipartisan effort, passed a piece of legislation that basically excludes from arbitration uh, sex harassment claims. And what that what the new law said is that uh, arbitration agreements that are entered into pre-dispute, so before an allegation of sex harassment is made, uh, think of an arbitration agreement that you might have employees sign at the inception of employment, that those uh, excluded from those arbitration agreements are claims of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And so it, those claims can still be arbitrated, but the employee and the company must agree to arbitrate those claims post allegations. So at the time the allegations are made or after the allegations are made, they can't agree to arbitrate those types of claims before the conduct has taken place. Well, Congress now, and it's really getting a lot of traction, is now seeking to enter, or they, they are talking about introducing a new piece of legislation that has virtually identical language to that, but this time it would exclude from arbitration agreements uh, age discrimination claims. There's also some talk being floated around, all this, though this one's not getting nearly as much traction, but also a separate piece of legislation to exclude race discrimination claims. And so what this represents really is kind of this tug of war that we've been seeing between the governmental agencies, in particular uh, the, the Supreme Court, uh, which has said that arbitration agreements for the most part are enforceable. And Congress doesn't like what the Supreme Court has done. And so now Congress is working to pass legislation to exclude certain types of claims from uh, pre-dispute arbitration agreements. Mm -hmm. All right. That's, uh, I mean, that to me, that, I don't, does that give uh, strength to the union and the arbitration uh, element of, of what they offer, or does it weaken the position of a union um, from your point of view? Yeah, I don't think this really has too much to do with the union contracts uh, as much as it does just pre-dispute arbitration agreements that, uh, that, that, that cover about an estimated 60 million employees in the United States. Okay, gotcha. Understood. All yep. right. That's what well, I got for you today. That is, that is great. We appreciate you uh, jumping on the, the podcast this morning, and I know you got some important work to do. So if you jump off, uh, we understand that. Um, you're, you're in good hands great, with man. Jim. You're looking great. No, we got Jim Plunkett here. We're going to be just fine. I do want to introduce uh, Philbert's. Uh, actually, I want to go back to our polls uh, real quick and get those kicked off. I forgot to do that first thing. Um, here's our poll question. We have two, uh, two questions for you. In what discipline does Congress have the most impact on employer behaviors? And we have a list of six or seven options for you there. And then the second question, 
We love our word clouds. You know that. One word or phrase, what is the biggest motivator for Congress? Um, Who? mine is money. All right, that's my one word, money. Let's see if uh, if that gets any traction. All right, uh, Nick, can we kick off Filbert's Forum? This is really good. I like this one. You've just entered Filbert's Forum, where we peel the onion back and take a lighter look at the workplace. All right. So it, you know, it can be hard to share your name with a celebrity and uh, some people we know um, very well may share a name with the celebrity. So let's take a look here. We have uh, Matthew Broderick um, and here is a, here's a picture of the Matthew we know and the Matthew we don't know. And the Matthew we don't know says, uh, I made a reservation at a restaurant. When we showed up, the hostess was totally disappointed to see me. Uh, we had a separate section with a separate table, totally off from everybody else. It goes to show you some of the, the power in the name, Matthew Broderick. Um, then Taylor Swift, this is a good one because <laughs> Taylor could be male or female um, by naming convention here. Um, and we have uh, Taylor receives around 10 emails a day telling him how beautiful, talented, and inspiring he is, or telling him uh, he needs to get a husband. Uh, that's quite funny. Uh, that would not be uh, a good name to walk around with, nor would this one necessarily, I don't think, and that is the name Donald Trump. Uh, he noticed someone looking down at his credit card or ID and a smile and refrain from commenting, which he greatly appreciates that. Actually, the other Donald Trump there in that picture looks like a general, it looks like a lawyer in that picture, doesn't he? It's like <laughs> a his, little bit. Maybe, maybe like a lawyer, that's right. And our favorite and our guest today, <laughs> Jim Plunkett. Jim, this is awesome. At first, it was a bit of a downer seeing the look of disappointment on fans' faces, but ever since you've embraced it, worked real hard, and now you do birthday parties. Welcome to the program, <laughs> Jim. I know you've had love, to live with that one your whole life, haven't you? I, I, I love that. That's fabulous. Thank you, guys. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, you know, here in Washington, D.C., there's a local news reporter named Kevin McCarthy. Um, so and he obviously shares the same name as the current Speaker of the House. Right. Uh, and he, he always on his his Twitter feed, the news reporter's Twitter feed, he's always sort of retweeting these like nasty tweets that that he gets from from people. And he has to remind them that he's not uh, the the politician, Kev, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. So it can no, be That tough. would not be one you want to be, that would be like being Donald Trump, right? You'd, no, you know, I mean, it's gotta be way. like, yeah, just, just constant, just constant. Yeah. I think uh, you being associated with, uh, you know, football quarterback, that's a good one to be, right? That's, that, you can accept that. You hey, know? you know, he won two Super Bowls and a Heisman Trophy, so that's not too bad. Not too bad, that's right. Mm -hmm. And, All right, and from Jim. the other perspective, quarterback Jim Plunkett is lucky to have the same name as our own Jim Plunkett. Oh, from I appreciate that, Bert. <laughs> That's right. Brains versus bronze here, I think, is what mm -hmm. we have a battle of. Um, but, Jim, we're happy to have you on the program and, and, and grateful for you taking some time. Uh, we've had uh, uh, maybe six months on uh, the first half of this year and with some activity and Bert has been keeping us up to date with his section of lawyer on the clock and has done a good job and maybe the first thing i want to draw some attention to is um what we might see on the timeline uh what lies ahead of us and Bert was talking a little bit about um you know gig economy workers and uh and contract workers versus employees uh, I'd like to get some insight from you in that, if you can share, please. Sure. So um, I'm happy to answer that, Phil. Before I do, there's something that uh, something that Bert mentioned that brought something to my mind, um, and that's about that that Starbucks case and about yes. you know trends that we might be seeing in the coming months and years in terms of litigation. Um, you know, the Supreme Court in any day now, really, certainly by the end of June, is expected to issue a decision. Uh, relating to affirmative action in the college admissions process. Um, now, the Supreme Court there is not interpreting uh, uh, Title VII or the FLSA or what, you know workplace statutes. It's uh, interpreting Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and and um, the Fourteenth Amendment. But there is concern um, uh, among um, many groups that, depending on what the Supreme Court rules, like say if they strike down the use of affirmative action in the college admissions process, 
that depending on how they rule and how the, the decision is worded, that folks might be able to take that decision, that language, that doctrine, um, and use it to go after employer um, hiring policies, um, affirmative action obligations of federal contractors, employer um, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, um, employer resource, employee resource groups, that, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of the, the moon and the stars have to align. You know, there's a lot of dots that need to be connected, but that's just something that's very much on the top of folks' minds here in Washington, D.C., as we expect to uh, have this decision come out any day um, from, the, from the Supreme Court. Um, so this decision is really focused on universities, but it could have some overflow into, uh, you know, the rest of the world is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, not 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 immediate, but you're going to have clever um, sort of plaintiffs attorneys who are going to um, dissect and fly spec whatever the Supreme Court does and say, hey, how can I use this to go after um, employer diversity, equity, inclusion efforts? Yeah, kind of um, one of those, if it's good and it works for us in the universities, well, then it should be good and work for us here. And this is what employers should be uh, focusing on, or this is what they haven't been doing. So our, our affirmative action standards that we have today are not necessarily uh, under any, uh, any microscope for this decision, but it could be an overflow. Right. A a absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, but so, so moving on to your question, Phil, I just wanted to get that out. But move moving on to your question, yeah, lots of activity um, in Washington D.C. these days. And even though the calendar reads uh, June fifteenth, twenty twenty three, much of what's happening in Washington D.C. is with an eye towards twenty twenty four and the elections, right? Yeah, so right. it's it, it's amazing to think that we're already in this political season. Um, and so what everything that Congress is doing and the agencies are doing, there's that underlying element of, well, how is this impacting 2024? How is this going to help us, what, whoever they are, the Democrats or the Republicans, how is, it, how is this going to help us politically? So in, in Congress, I'm going to talk about sort of two big, but I'll talk about Congress first, Phil, and then I'll talk about the agencies. And I'm going to echo a lot of what um, Bert said, because I, I, I agree with um, with everything that he said about the arbitration, independent contractors. But in, in Congress, you know, um, uh, things are, this isn't the, the 117th Congress, the Congress that 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 we just uh, finished that went from uh, that was 2021 and 2022. Uh, I, I poke fun at Congress a lot for being incompetent. Um, but that Congress actually passed a fair amount of legislation that's impacting our, our attendees, right, that are impacting employers. You've got, uh, uh, Bert mentioned the uh, sexual harassment carve out from arbitration agreements. They also passed the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which goes into effect in just a couple of weeks. Um, they passed, uh, passed the Pump Act uh, relating to um, uh, uh, nursing mothers at, at work. Um, uh, they, they passed... Um, uh, some prevailing wage uh, legislation, some uh, multi-employer pension benefit plan legislation. So a fair amount of activity in the employment space coming out of the previous Congress. I don't think we're going to see that in, in this Congress, right? It's going to be a heavier lift um, with perhaps uh, the exception of, you know, I am watching the arbitration space as for the reasons that, that Bert mentioned. Also, very similarly, a, a lot of people view uh, non-compete agreements um, in a similar, um, from a similar viewpoint as they uh, um, view uh, arbitration agreements because they think they're sort of inequities of bargaining power that employees don't know what they're signing. So there is some bipartisan skepticism uh, relating to, to non-compete agreements. So I'm, I'm watching that space uh, very carefully. Yeah, we also, have talked a lot about that one on the program in, in particular, uh, just yeah. for, uh, every few weeks has kept us up to date on the on the progression of that. It, uh, it, that it's can have big, big impacts on the employers. Of course, yeah, because you've got it. You've got to watch it from the legislative space. And then also the, the, the fair trade, uh, the Federal Trade Commission um, is uh, is working on it, too, from a, an administrative uh, regulatory um, viewpoint. Um, the uh, um, the the last thing that I would mention from a bipartisan standpoint is uh, child labor. Um, 
the you know once th those that New York Times article came out and we've seen stories on 60 Minutes, there's definitely Republicans and Democrats who are. I'm not saying they're joining arms, but they're thinking about joining arms. Okay, Jim, that's uh, and, something we haven't talked about. Tell us just a little bit of background on that, please. If you yeah, can. so there is, um, within the last six months or so, there's been some high-profile uh, stories um, detailing uh, situations of uh, where we've got child child labor. Um, and um, there's a confluence of circumstances that, that sort of led to this. Um, one, you know, first and foremost is perhaps unscrupulous employers, but then there's also, um, it's happening a lot in the migrant community and you've got, um, false, um, uh, identifications being presented. You've got, um, ch children wearing PPE and sneaking in on the third shift, you know, when there's, uh, and you can't really identify them as, as, as being obviously minors, um, so um, uh, there's been, um, and it's, but regardless, you've still got, however it happens, um, yeah. I don't think anybody wants children uh, in the workplace, especially doing uh, dangerous work. Uh, so there is um, some elements of um, yeah. bipartisanship. There, I can see where there could be some bipartisanship on that. We weren't right. able to achieve bipartisanship on uh, child labor in my household. Um, you know, I, I was trying to get my kids to mow the grass and my wife thought I was being unreasonable. Uh, right. Of course, so did so did my children. Uh, so I, I lost I, that debate. Yeah, I, I, I get it. But so so that that's Congress. And, 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 and I know we're running out of time. Um, I do want to make sure I talk a little bit about what we could see from the regulatory space. Um, one thing I'm sure you guys have talked about artificial intelligence. Uh, yes. And right. So to me. It's like that, that old saying, like, birds got to fly, fish got to swim. Well, regulators got to regulate, right? And so um, folks in Washington, D.C., whether they're legislators or regulators, they're looking at AI and they're saying, oh, my gosh, this is a shiny new toy they can we can regulate. They are also very, like we all are, very deeply concerned about how um, AI, how to sort of balance the, the, the benefits of AI and, and, and the efficiencies that that can create for us and for employers with some of the, the, the potential pitfalls. Um, and when you start to think about Congress and regulators about, um, you know, uh, from a national security standpoint, from a copyright standpoint, from a tax standpoint, there, there's all sorts of implications here, right, for, uh, for artificial intelligence. There's nothing immediate in the works right now, but I just want your viewers to know that it seems like in the last two months, the, the sort of light bulb went off here with uh, regulators in Washington, D.C., and they were all sort of scrambling about how they can um, get their arms around this. Of course, in the employment space, um, it's and a We lot are going to have uh, Jane Bettis on next week to talk about AI in particular. Um, Perfect. Which I think will be fantastic conversation. Uh, Perfect. I think right. everyone's interested in. A a absolutely. So the other thing, too, and I just want to echo... Um, uh, what Bert said about independent contractors, right? So we had the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, they decided their case um, uh, this past week. Well, the Department of Labor, and that, that's inter they're interpreting the National Labor Relations Act, right? Just one statute, right? Well, the Department of Labor, they're interpreting um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the act that controls child labor, overtime, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, so we're expecting them by the end of the summer to come out with uh, their own test that's going to sort of mirror um, or be, be very similar to what the NLRB did. And I completely agree with what Bert said about how that um, the whole idea there is to make sure that most as many workers as possible are categorized as employees so they can get um you know, uh, all the, the tax benefits or so that they, they, they're paying taxes and the employer's paying taxes, right? Follow the money, as you said uh, earlier, right. Phil, right? Yeah, the government's got to get their follow money. Follow the money. Yep. Um, but so that, that we expect that to come out um, in, in, in August. Um, okay. So, so pay attention to that. And I'm also, the other big battle, um, and I can, I'll leave you with this, Phil. The other big battle is that we're expecting sometime this summer, perhaps later in the summer, the Department of Labor to propose changes to the overtime regulations. So we're talking about the salary basis test, the duties test, 
Very similar, we're expecting to see what we saw in 2016. Um, so if that was an issue for your attendees, those 2016 changes that were eventually stopped, they were they were enjoined by a federal court, but we're expecting a, in the employer community, we're expecting a very similar battle over those uh, potential provisions. We expect to see that proposal, like I said, come out towards the end of the summer. Yeah, I, I would assume there's not a lot of bipartisanship on that proposal. No, and in fact, it's going to, if anything, I think you're going to have um, uh, Democrats in more rural um, areas um, who, who might say, hey, you know, increasing the salary basis threshold might work in Los Angeles or Manhattan, but it's not going to work in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, or what, you know, in, in my, my district. So yeah. um, it's going to be a little bit of a lift for the administration. And I think that's some of the importance of, you know, where some of these uh, appointees come from and the states that they come from and what they represent while they've been in, in their current position in those states and how that can overflow, uh, you know, into the rest of the country by being appointed. Um, Absolutely. I know, I know Bert is always mentioning that, particularly when we get, you know, the the California influence and, and some of the standards that they have in California that the rest of us um, might suffer a little bit under. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Jim, we always love having you on the program. You're looking good. We're happy to have you. Anytime you got something to update us on, thank you for joining us. I know I did not get to our poll results. I'm going to post those on Twitter as soon as we're done, and you can join there and take a look at the results, um, see if money was the big money maker. And we will be back uh, next week with Jane Bettis, and we're going to talk about AI, and we'll see you then on This Week at Work. See you then. Thank you once again for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link aimea.org forward slash This Week at Work or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment like LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere you are. And you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.work. We'll see you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.